much that we can glean from it. We've already looked at a, a few of the churches. Today we're going to look at Thyatira. Thyatira is the smallest city of all the churches there. They're known for the color purple. They produce the color purple, which is the color of royalty. Matter of fact, Thyatira is kind of the buffer zone. Usually when Asia Minor was attacked, it was always Thyatira that was attacked first. Uh, however, the, the, the city itself is named after Tyremnus, the sun god. That's where you get uh, Thyatira from. And so, uh, as with the other churches, we find there was a lot of pagan worship that was going on during that time. And so I want to share with you, really this is, out of the seven churches, this is a defiled church. Uh, and, and so I, I pray that uh, God would uh, would really convict our hearts about how to do church and how to be church and uh, to be separate from the world after studying this church here this morning. So uh, if you have your Bibles again, we're in Revelation chapter 2. We'll begin in verse 18 and go through verse 29. We ask you to rise to your feet as always. Pay tribute to the reading of God's Word, Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. Verse 18 says, And unto the angel of the church. And what were the angels? Either that was angels that were over the church, or it was to the pastor of the church. And so this letter is written there. And again, each church of the seven churches represents every kind of church that you can find in the world, even unto today. And so it says there, right, uh, to the angel at the church of Thyatira, right, these things saith the Son of God, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like fine grass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest the woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into bed, and them that committeth adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest of Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works until the end to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod, rod of iron, and the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to sh uh, shivers, even as I receive of my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. This is, of the seven churches, a defiled church. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come today, as we've been studying the churches dear Heavenly Father, we are challenged by your word to be the church of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that as we've seen the piercing eyes of Jesus, seeing the churches there at Asia Minor, the same thing is true for us here today. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we are challenged in our hearts and our minds and our thought process of what church needs to be and should be and what it should look like. And so, Father, today, as we look at this defiled church, may we get the warning that Jesus Christ has for the churches. He that has an ear, let him hear what is written to the churches. Just be with us. Watch over, keep us, forgive us where we fail you. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. As always, inside of your bulletin, you have a fill-in-the-blank there that you can follow along with and fill in the blank as we go through uh, the, the sermon this morning. I want to begin by looking at Jesus Christ and uh, writing to the churches. And what we've been able to find is this, is that Jesus Christ begins the letter with a commendation. And I want you to understand that Jesus Christ, we see that in every church that we've seen, Jesus says the same thing about seeing the church and the work that was going on here in the church. And so as we begin in this commendation that Jesus 
Christ uh, gives, the first thing that he does is he looks at the service. Jesus Christ comes and he confirms the service of the church. Now this is not a church that is doing nothing. This is not a church that is sitting back on its backside and, and, and just waiting for the Lord's return. It really is a, a busy church. Can I share with you that you can be busy with Jesus Christ. You can be, be busy doing the things of church and still miss Jesus Christ. You can be busy doing the things of the church and have your name on a roll and still be lost uh, uh, as it comes down to the things uh, of the kingdom of God. And so we find here in this commendation, Jesus confirms the service in verse 19. Notice what he says there. And by the way, in verse 18, it kind of goes back and shares that Jesus Christ, uh, the one that has these eyes of fire and feet of brass. You remember when, when John was writing about the description of the man who stood in the middle of the churches there that was writing the letters, had these eyes of fire, Je Jesus had these eyes of fire, which was a penetrating look. It is a, it is a look of, of, of refinement. It is a look of, of trying with fire. The way that you would uh, melt a metal in order to get out the impurities but there's a penetrating look. It is the look that Peter found and Peter saw when Peter denied him and Jesus Christ turned around and looked at Peter and Peter went out and wept bitterly after he had denied him those three times. And so the Bible says here that it is those eyes of fire that was looking at the church of Thyatira there and, and we find that Jesus Christ gives them this commendation in verse 19. He says, I know thy work. Notice there he says work first and he also ends this with works again. He says, I know thy works in charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works. And he goes on, he says, and the last will be more than the first. Our Lord uh, uh, always begins with this uh, recognition of, of what the church is doing right and, and, and so it was no different here. Uh, Thyatira is no different. He, 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 he wants to share with them the things that they are doing right. But in that recognition he, he's going to conf confirm some things uh, about this church and, and again it's, it's some good things. Matter of fact on the surface when you begin to hear this you would say hey this is a church that's got it going on. Here is a church where the people are doing what they're supposed to do if, if you just stop with the commendation. He confirms their action. They're, this is a church of action. It is a, a church that is working. Uh, notice what he said there. He says, I know your works and your service. Now, uh, I, I want to share with you right there, this work and this service, uh, they were busy doing good deeds. Uh, they were benefiting those that were around them, no doubt. The word service and ministry that is used there is actually the word that, that we translate in the New Testament for deacon, actually. And so it was like they were literally doing the work of the deacons, uh, uh, you know, in the New Testament time when the widows were being mis mistreated and, and the deacons were, were, were chosen to serve at the tables and, and, and to become part of service. Uh, well, we find that's exactly what it says here. They have this, uh, this uh, service about them that is benefiting. Matter of fact, the idea of this uh, actually is it has the idea of stirring up dust or, or kicking up dust. They were, they were so busy in this pagan, in this small little city, in this pagan city there, they were literally kicking up, stirring up a cloud of dust as they were. And notice those penetrating eyes of Jesus notices this work. It does not go without notice. Uh, uh, and I want you to see this because he sees you and I today. He sees the service and the work that you and I does, uh, that we do in our life, uh, the action that we take in our life, and, and the things that we do that serve others, and uh, you know, in, in that service. And so I, I hope and pray that we're doing those kinds of things, and that we're doing the work, and, and that it would be said of us, what is said of this church here, that when Jesus looked at us, he would, he would say the same thing in verse 19. He would give us that commendation. I know your works. I know your charity, your love, and your service. And faith and, and patience and, and thy works. And then he comes back and he says, in the last to be more than the first. And so, literally, that we would be a church that would be found 
kicking up dust in our everyday lives. We're kicking up dust every day in our lives. We're stirring up the dust uh, as we're busy about the things uh, of God. Now, let me share this. Busyness with God doesn't save you, but that ought to be a, an action that you and I have. It should be an action that the Lord see. Notice the Lord didn't condemn them for that. It was actually a commendation that he was sharing with them how he seen this work that they done. Not only that, but hey, attitude. There's a lot of attitude in church. There's a lot of different attitudes and people that have attitudes and the fact of the matter is, God sees our attitudes too. And so he comes to this church and he confirms the, their attitude that is there. And listen, he spoke of their charity. Their attitude is one of love. Their attitude is one of faith. Their attitude is one of patience. Uh, the love that they have is that it, 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 it leans on that side of that agape love. It is God's unconditional love where, where it would uh, drive you to serve others, not expecting anything in return. And, and so they're, uh, they're doing uh, that kind of thing. Listen, they have no boundaries. Uh, uh, they're not influenced by outside circumstances uh, somewhat, especially the core of the church, uh, that remnant in the church. Uh, uh, listen, they were, they were faithful. Notice what he said. I see your love. They've got love for the community they're in. They've got love one for another. They have faith. Uh, uh, in other words, they are full of faith, faithful. You can count on them to finish the task that they were doing. They had an attitude of patience. Isn't that what he said there? I, I, I see all these works that you look at that verse uh, uh, 19. How great would it be in those penetrating eyes of Jesus is it, if, if he looked at us and said, hey, uh, Larry Town, I know your works, I, I, I know your charity, I know your service, I know your faith, uh, thy patience and thy works. Listen, the patience and, and your works and the last uh, be more uh, than the first. And so, man, you, you got a good attitude about you. Uh, uh, they stood under the, the load uh, uh, that they bore in this place. And, and, and listen, they were committed to the work of God. Sounds great. Again, this is a commendation, my Lord. Man, they've got service. He, he confirms their service. He, uh, he confirms their action. He, he confirms their attitude. All of this uh, under this service. It, uh, listen, in order to do service, you've got to do the right actions. In order to have the right service, you've got to have the right attitude. And then, then he confirmed their attendance and how they attend to things and, and, and notice things. Uh, uh, Jesus honors them in that, in that uh, 19B there. He said, he, said this, he said, and the last to be more than the first. Now, what in the world is Jesus talking? about that. Well, it's very simple to see that he begins that commendation. He said, I know your works. And then he kind of lists out all these works that they're doing. And then he comes back again and he says, and I know thy works. Look at verse uh, 19. I, I know thy works. That's one time. And, and then he breaks it down. Charity and service and faith and thy patience. And then notice this. And thy works. Well, didn't he just say that in the first part? Then he says this, and the last works to be more than the first work. In other words, uh, instead of slacking off, and instead of giving up, they're literally moving forward in the ministry. They're, they're continuing and, and they're doing more and more and they're increasing in what they're doing. And the work they're doing now is greater than the works when they first began. Again. Matter of fact, isn't that great? Don't we need to be like that? We need to continue to move forward as they did, move forward in our faith and grow in our faith and grow in our works and grow in our love and grow in our charity and grow in our, our, our uh, service one to another. We, we see how he said, man, you're getting better at the end. You're doing more now than your, than your works at the very beginning. And so we need to do that. We, we ought to be doing more now than we did when we were first saved and and, and so, uh, what a great church. These were people uh, of good works. If you can say anything about Thyra Tower, it's say, man, these are workers. Look at how well they work. Look at their good works. Now, you and I know, again, that good works don't save us. Because uh, here's the thing. They were doing all the work, but spiritually, they were lacking. They were doing all that they could under the guise of God, and yet spiritually they were dead on the inside, or at least some of them was there. And so we find from this 
accommodation, we find that Jesus Christ moves then into a condemnation. He literally comes and he condemns this church, even though, again, they're doing, uh, doing some great works that are there. But listen, it is about the spiritual. That's why, listen, a lot of times I say, I'm, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not worried uh, about our works because if our, we get our spiritual side right, then, then that will flow into us doing the things of God. Uh, let, let, me, let me share this with you. If, if uh, you know, a person comes and says, you know, I, I've been saved and, 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 and I'm having a hard time. Let's, let's, let's just use an alcoholic. I don't, I, I'm not, not, not anybody in mind, but let's just say somebody who's an alcoholic. And they're really fighting this uh, alcohol and, and listen, they're lost and, and they want to, uh, remember I told you, just tell your story. Your, your testimony is your story that God has done in your life because people want to know how did you do it? How did you get it right? How did you get it all together? And, and, and so this alcoholic, maybe he, he, wants to, he wants to get his life right. All right let's say he, he accepts Jesus Christ as his Savior. And but the next morning he gets up and he wants to take a drink. Now, I'll be honest with you, Jesus Christ can take that desire away. And I've run across people who, who this is actually their life story. Listen, they, they, they were drunk and Jesus came in their life. And the very next day they didn't never take another drop. But that's not everybody's case. That's not everybody's case. Sometimes that old alcoholic, he's accepted Jesus Christ. Him and Jesus is working on this alcohol. This, uh, you know, he's an alcoholic working on this in his life. But the next morning he gets up and he 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 he, he drinks. Uh, he's got to have a drink. And people say, "Well, oh, I don't know if he's saved or not." Well, let me tell you this: uh, Jesus is about to work in his life. That's what I want you to know. Jesus, listen, because if you if you follow Jesus and you and, and, and you begin to worship Jesus, Jesus will begin to chip away at those things and, and your life begins to change. See, you don't go to a super saint. That didn't happen in Paul's life. There's this chipping away that God does. And the closer we get, the further we realize there, that we are away from God. But 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 there's this spirit begins to work in us. And, and, and little by little, over a period of time, day by day, our lives begin begins to be transformed in a way that was totally different of, of how our life was when we lived uh, by the world standards. Now notice this. This was not what was happening here though. This church is literally spiritually, or for many of them, more spiritually dead. And because of that, this condemnation comes, Jesus chastises their sin. Why? Because outwardly, listen, we can fool people a lot of times with how we live our lives. We can fool people by the things that we post on Facebook. We can fool people by how we talk with them when we meet them in the supermarket. But here's a church that outwardly, they look like a solid church, but inwardly they were filled with corruption. Corruption had overtaken this church uh, to the depth that Jesus Christ noticed the very corruption. And listen, it wasn't just a little bit of corruption, but it was a whole lot of uh, uh, corruption. Matter of fact, it leads to the next point there where, where, where literally Jesus Christ began to reveal a, a warning. There are warning signs that the Spirit gives in your life. There are warning signs that Jesus gives to the church. There's warning signs. Listen, that prick on your heart that the Spirit has moved in you sometimes when you know it ain't the right thing, when you know you didn't do the right thing, when you didn't say the right thing, literally is a warning that comes uh, from Jesus Christ, uh, a warning that comes from the Spirit of God. Uh, you know, I shared uh, on Facebook, and it's so true, so many people today, uh, instead of allowing conviction to convict them, they literally are offended. Conviction, they no longer accept conviction, it literally offends them. But I share with you that conviction is a warning that is given by God. Notice in verse 28 there, uh, the first part of 20, it says, notwithstanding. Here's that con uh, condemnation that is coming there. Notwithstanding, I, I have a few things against thee, because I suffer the woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach, listen to this, in the church, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and eat things a sacrifice unto idols. Let me tell you what their number one problem was. Uh, here it is, one word, we can sum it in one word, tolerance. Does that sound familiar in the world we're living in today? 
Does it sound like what the world is telling us today? That the church must be tolerant? Literally, Jesus Christ said, you have become tolerant. That, 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 there was a particular problem at the center of this corruption. Uh, literally, he says there, he says, uh, uh, the ideal of this sufferest, uh, uh, not, notwithstanding, uh, verse 20, and notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest. See that word sufferest right there? The word sufferest right there means to, to tolerate, to permit. To allow. That's what suffers me. So you, you have become tolerant. You have allowed. You have permitted that woman Jezebel. Thyatira had began tolerating false doctrine and allowing, the, uh, allowing these uh, heretics to defile their walk with God. Now, just like the alcoholic, it didn't happen overnight. It literally didn't happen overnight. But it literally happens, and this is why how it always happens, it happens through an attitude of compromise. Let me share with you again what I have said. You can have the principle of compromise, but you cannot compromise your principles. Amen. And so that's exactly where this church was. It had the ideal of compromise because it wanted to fit in. It had the ideal of compromise because, well, everybody else is doing it. Uh, listen, this, uh, you and I understand this, that the church, we need to take a stand on the Word of God. We need to stand on the Word of God. Listen, if our people and our programs don't line up with the Bible, then we don't need it. We don't need to be doing it. It's, it, it is easy to become tolerant of what is influential or what is popular. That's why we hear the language of our day today. That's why in society, you're hearing the word used so much, this word of tolerance. Because the more you hear it, the more popular it becomes, then the more easy it becomes to become tolerant. Well, you hear things in the church today, or you hear things in society today, uh, well, like, like things like this. Well, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I will share with you again, God's not worried about your feelings. He's worried about your salvation. Amen. Jesus Christ offended people in his lifetime. Did he love them? Oh, yes. But was he tolerant? No. I, I've heard people say, well, Jesus Christ ate with sinners, so he must have been tolerant. No, he ate with sinners so he could change their life. There's a big difference in that. It's a big difference that Jesus loved people and he was in the middle of people like that, not because he was tolerant, not because he was tolerating what they were doing, but he was literally there to offer to them salvation and cleanliness and righteousness to change their life. But I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. Well, everyone else thinks that it's okay. I wish I had a dime or a dollar every time I heard that. Well, everybody else thinks it's okay. Listen, I don't, I don't want to hurt people either. But I am more concerned with the well-being of our church and people's eternity than I am about people's feelings. You can take that out how you want to take that. But that's, that's true. That's where we ought to be. If, if we're worried about the feelings of people, we're, we're literally going to tolerate and they're going to die and go to hell. Jesus looked at this church and said the same thing. You're tolerant. You sufferest. You have tolerated this woman Jezebel. What did they tolerate? What was this woman Jezebel? Whether her name was Jezebel or she was just a Jezebel, uh, a, 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 a resemblance of the Jezebel in the Old Testament. By the way, Jezebel in the Old, Old Testament was uh, uh, King Ahab's wife, uh, and she literally led people into idolatry worship. Their doctrine. It's the doctrine that he's looking at. What is doctrine? Doctrine is what you believe. Because thy sufferest, verse 20, thy sufferest the woman, uh, Jezebel, which calls herself a prophet. Notice this. She's not a prophet. She, she, she's not a prophetess. She literally has made herself. She literally has called herself. She is a self-claimed prophetess. They had allowed a prophetess by the name or the resemblance of Jezebel of the Old Testament time to teach 
and to seduce them. Uh, that, listen, one of the most wicked women in the Bible is Jezebel. And one of the most wickedest women uh, that was married to King Ahab. She was a key, a key player in, in defiling Israel. Matter of fact, it was Jezebel that Elijah ran from and sat down by the dry brook because she was trying to kill Elijah. It was later on. Later on that uh, the armies came in and listen, here, here's, the, here's what happened to Jezebel. They threw her out the window. The, her own, the, the eunuchs of the kingdom, of, of, listen, the, the queen Jezebel, her own eunuchs grabbed her and throwed her out of the window. But that's not the worst thing. A little later, they went to bury her, and the dogs had eaten her. I don't want to be crude, but that's the story. That's the story of Jezebel. Let me, let me ask you, how many people you know named Jezebel? Who, who's other name their daughter is Jezebel? You know why? Because the name is synonymous with, with idolatry, worship, with sexual immorality, uh, with, with, with worship of Baal. The, uh, listen, the fertility, that's how she was worshiping it. Uh, these big pagan fe uh, feasts that she was having. And, and so uh, whether this, this woman that was here, this prophet here, was actually named Jezebel, or is just an example of that, this is what the church was being tolerant of. You suffer this kind of teaching in your church. Hmm. So the people were being led away from God. See, you and I, we, we've got to study the Word of God. We need sound doctrine taught. We need doctrine, uh, sound doctrine preached uh, in the church. Know what feel good? Hey, you can preach feel-good sermons and you can fill up the pew with people who are dying and going to hell. The Word of God must be preached, the true doctrine. We must stand on the street corners. We must stand uh, 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 for the people that we meet and share with them the true doctrine of the Bible. I am convinced that everyone who has reverend or brother in front of their name who carry a Bible is not a man of God who stands in the pulpit. We must be careful uh, about whom we listen to and about compromising the truth. I've told you time and time again, don't take my word for it. Go search it yourself if what I'm preaching is true or not. Their doctrine. Not only did he warn them about their doctrine, he warned them about their disobedience. Watch this. He says, he says in verse 21, And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. So, and, and everybody says, man, I can't believe somebody would do that. And I go back to this. There are times in our life when the Holy Spirit pricks our heart, and we don't, we don't follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. We're rejecting the Holy Spirit and the work that the Spirit wants to do in us. One of the things that I always pray before I, every Sunday I pray this, Lord, just let us be receptive to your Spirit. Because that's the work in us, the Spirit working in us. God's Spirit, that's, that the Spirit's doing God's work in us. And so, listen, I, I pray, uh, Lord, if, uh, if, uh, if the Spirit pricks their hearts to come to an altar and pray, Lord, I pray that they come to the altar and they pray. Lord, that they don't, they don't listen, they don't go against the Spirit. Listen, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't hurt the Spirit or, or the moving of the Spirit in their lives. Why? Because the warnings of God comes by the move of the Spirit. Why? Because the work of God comes by the moving of the Spirit. Notice here, this church, those that was in the church following the doctrine that was here had the opportunity to repent, and yet they don't. They literally are rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit. Aren't you glad, though? Listen to this. Even in this church, what do we see? We see the work of God. We see the long-suffering. Aren't you glad that we serve a merciful, long-suffering God? Aren't you glad that God gives you chance after chance? Listen, even in their wickedness, God gave them plenty of time to repent, but they would not. Listen, the Lord is patient, no doubt. But His patience doesn't last forever. When people continue in sin and they continue to reject the conviction of God, problems are going to come. I don't know how many times I've run across people in 34 years of ministry. 
Y'all see how old Tracy is, right? So in 34 years of ministry, I run across people who say, you know, my life is falling apart. They're no longer in church. They're not reading the Bible the way that they should now. And I'm telling you, listen, that just because you're coming to church doesn't mean that your life is going to be all, all great and nothing's going to happen. But I would much rather be in the presence of God. And I much rather would be in, be in the Word of God when I do life than not be. And, and, and you know, you know my you know my favorite my favorite line now when people come to me and say, "Well, my life was good, but now it's falling apart." And I'm like, "Hey, are you in church?" No, I'm not in church. Well, yeah, you understand then, right? You're you're going against the the the, the Holy Spirit. You're going against the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. You, you're going against the, the the word of God being preached to you, and, and you wonder why your life is falling apart. You know what my saying is, right? How's that working for you? How's that working? We see the disobedience. We see them rejecting the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, I believe there are people today that's in an early grave because of their disobedience to God. And you may not agree with that, but that's okay. But I, I believe this sometimes in Christian's life. Listen, God, if, you, if, if, if God can't, can't be with you here and you're not going to be uh, with God down here as a Christian, he'll just call you home when you be up there with him. And so we see the, the disobedience. We, we see their, their discipline. Look at this in verses 22 and, and verse 23. He says, behold, I will. I, this is how he's going to discipline. See, that's what happens. And when disobedience happens, uh, it, 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 uh, God's going to chastise uh, his people no doubt. Matter of fact, this world is coming to Jesus. This world, there's going to be, there's going to be a day where every tongue shall confess and every knee shall bow. Some, it's going to be too late, yeah. But there's going to be a discipline. God's going to discipline this world that we live in, this sin riddled world. Behold, I will cast her into bed, verse 22, and then they commit adultery with her. Listen, the adultery that they're committing is an adultery against God. Because see, if you're not loving the way that you should, if you don't love the person you're supposed to love, and you're loving someone else, that's adultery. And so they're literally committing adultery against God. And so they committed adultery with her in the great tribulation. Notice that. They're going to be in great tribulation. Except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill their children. Oh, you mean he said that? Listen, this is the, the disciples of, uh, of Baal, of false teachings. Uh, uh, listen, uh, I'll tell you this. God's going to purge his church. There's coming a day where God's going to purge the church. Not all that sits in the pew. In the, in the book of Matthew it says, Have we not in your name cast out demons? And in your name have we not done mighty works? That's exactly what our tower could say. Have we not cast out demons? And in your name done mighty works? And on that day he'll look at us and say, Depart from me, I never knew you. Amen. There are people who are going to die and go to hell sitting in a church pew. Notice this, the discipline. I will kill her children. He's going to purge the church. He gets rid. He listen to battle against the disciples of evil. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and the heart. I, I, I know this. The Bible is true in this. Is that Jesus will judge sin. Matter of fact, this is what Jesus is, is saying here uh, to the churches. And you got in the bed of immorality. Jezebel is a bed of immorality. I'll give you the bed of death. I, I, I'll give you the bed of sickness. I will cast you into the, into the sickness bed. Why? Because Jesus will judge sin. He will cast the seductive heart into the bed of great tribulation. Along with all of those who have defiled themselves with her. Listen, it's not clear if this was physical or spiritual fornication, but likely, likely it's both of those. Either way, God is displeased with what he is seeing here. You and I are the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. When we defile ourselves with wickedness, we, can, we, we have committed spiritual fornication against the Lord. Jesus will judge sin. Second thing is this. He is holy, so therefore he cannot condone sin. You know, it's, it's the reason why God cannot lie. The Bible says that God cannot lie. Why can he not lie? Because it's not his nature. He doesn't have a sinful nature the way that you and I have a sinful nature. It is not his nature to do ill. It is not his nature to do wrong. He does not have a fallen nature like you and I. So it is impossible for God to lie. Why? Because he is holy. And if he is holy, he cannot condone sin. And so this is the reason why we find 
this discipline that is happening here uh, because of their disobedience. Not only that, but here's the thing. And this is what he, he does. He, he gives a solemn warning to the wicked about coming judgment. He gives a solemn warning to the wicked about the coming judgment. It is fearful to fall into the hands of a living God. Who holds the judgment against sin. Amen. The next thing that we find here is this. He reveals a witness though. He reveals a witness. Notice this in verse 23. And I will give unto every one of you according to your work. You can't rely on your spouse. Children you can't rely on your parents. Not for your rewards. Not for the things of your life. It is yours and yours only. I will give unto every one of you according to your words, many in thy retired thoughts. Listen, we live in a world today of mediocrity. We live in a world today where people are just getting by. Listen, in the, in the workplace, all they want to do is just enough. I've heard many people say, man, I just, I just want to make it inside the gates of heaven. I, I just want to get inside. That's literally how you want to live your spiritual life, just by getting by, just doing just enough. That's really how you want to live. Listen, many as I retired thought that they were getting by, that, that they, could, they could do as, their plea, as they pleased, and no one would know. They were hiding under the doctrine. But Jesus knows our hearts. He knows our thoughts. He knows our deeds as well. He's well aware of everything about us. We may hide sins from others, but we cannot hide it from God. He will not allow us to become a reproach to his name. Jesus tells them all the churches shall know who he is. I, I, I don't know about you, but I don't want, I don't want God to make a, an example of us to the other churches because of this. But hallelujah, listen to me. Listen, I, you, you may be brokenhearted right now. You may be down. But listen to this, church. Oh, the true church, Jesus comes and he has a word. I want you to know today that, the, that, that Jesus has a word for the true church. Those that hold to the doctrines of Jesus Christ. Those that hold on to the teachings of Jesus Christ. Those that do the, listen, that, that, that hold on to represent the name of Jesus Christ. Right? Those that are, are the proper bride of Christ. He comes back and listen to what he shares. Picking up in verse 24. Jesus begins uh, uh, to, to console the, the saints that are there. He, he recognizes, listen, he's recognized all those that have laid in the bed with the doctrine and, and the false teaching of that day, but he, he turns to those in the church, those that are the true church. Uh, I, I thank God for this. Listen, Jesus consoles the saints that are there. Uh, he comes in and he says, I recognize your faithfulness. Look in verse 24. But unto you I say, Unto the rest in thy time. Oh, not those that have been marked by those that have been against God. Not those that are, have been led away in false teaching. He said, oh, no, but to those that are the rest. Hey, to that remnant, to that, to that faithful one. You listen, the, the, you that have been faithful, you've been fighting the fight. You've been keeping the faith. Uh, uh, you've been doing all that you can. I want you to know that Jesus recognizes that. Jesus knows that in your life. But unto you I say, unto the rest of thy retire, as many as have not this doctrine, which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you no other burden. Jesus reminds him, hey, to stand on what you know is true. Hold fast to sound doctrine. Listen, it would have been difficult in this day and time. Half the church is following some other doctrine. They live in a place of immorality. Listen, it would be difficult to stand uh, for many in the church when so many had forsaken the Lord in that day and time. But Jesus encourages them. I want you to know that Jesus is encouraging you today. Hey, you just keep on keeping on. You just keep holding on. You keep fighting the fight. You keep praying the prayers. You keep reading the word of God. Jesus sees that. And he's the one that is encouraging us to keep on, keep it on, keep it on. Amen. It was been difficult for them. But hey, they stay true and they stay faithful. He says, I want you to, Jesus encourages them to stay true and faithful unto the end. We must do the same thing. This is God's will for our lives as well. Even if everyone around us forsakes the truth, we must remain steadfast. God's truth is the foundation of our lives. If we forsake truth, let me ask you this. 
If we forsake truth, what is left? It is when, like the disciples looked and, and they told Jesus, when Jesus was asking them, questioning them about who he was. Man, you are, the, you are the son of the living God. Who do we go to other than you, Jesus? There is no one like you. And so we must stand. Jesus is encouraging us to stand, to be faithful. He recognized, he saw, he, he, he saw the faithfulness of the few that was there. Not only that, look, in the faithfulness, they have a future. They have a future. Notice this. We get ready to close. Verse 25. But that which you have already, hold fast till I come. Oh, you got a future. Jesus reminded them that this world is not all there is for the child of God. Listen, it may get dark down here, but there's a brighter day ahead. Listen, here's, here's, here's what I want you to see. So many times people think our future lies in our hands. It doesn't. Our future does not lie in your hand or mine. Let me tell you what our future, and this is, this is in this church. Our future lies in his power. What kind of power? Well, you and I know that he called Lazarus from the dead and he came out of the tomb. It is a resurrection power. It is a restoration power. Look at, look at what he says, verse 26, verse 27. He that overcometh, to keep my work unto the end. To him will I give power. How does he give power? He has power. To him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And the vessel of a potter shall then be broken to shiver of uh, uh, shivers, uh, even as I receive my Father. Jesus is referring to the day. Listen, there's coming a day when Jesus Christ is going to come back to this earth. Now, there's a, there's a rapture that's going to happen when Jesus comes in the clouds. But there's coming a day when Jesus, who the world saw is defeated on the cross, is going to come back, and he's going to come back in power. And when he comes back in power, he's going to set a kingdom here on this earth. We call it the millennial reign. We call it the millennial time, right? And he's going to rule and he's going to reign for a thousand years. And he literally says this to those who have overcome. There is a promise that you and I will reign with Jesus. Right now, our world is dominated by sin and wickedness. But I'm telling you, in this power, there's coming a day when Jesus Christ in power is going to set things right. Church, you and I have an amazing power through Jesus Christ. It is power unto salvation. It is power unto life. It is power that transforms us from this world into a kingdom of God by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are not weaklings. We are not defeated. We are not lost. We are the ones that are victors. We are the ones that are more than conquer. Why? Because we have a future that is based not in our hands, not in our conduct, but in, what did I say? Not in conduct, but in position because we are in Christ in his power. The other thing is this. He shares with them about his power, then his person. I will give him the morning star. I love this. In a world that was full of darkness. He says, I, I will give him the morning star. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He has is, he is promised to them the morning star. They have endured much darkness. They have endured many in the church that has followed this false doctrine. But there is a promise of the coming of a bright and morning star. He will come in all of his power. And you know what a bright and morning star is? Not only in power, but the glory of God. The world is going to see that bright and morning star. The glory of God is coming. Listen, that their darkness uh, that they're in is not going to last forever. Morning is coming. You and I, we have the same hope in Christ today. <coughs> Here's what I know. Our world grows darker each day. But Jesus sees you. Hold on. This world is growing darker every day. But hold on, Christian. <coughs> For the morning is coming. Amen. The day is coming. 
of power and glory. It kind of changes that verse that says this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Why? Because even this day, we can see the power and the glory of God. I pray that we never become our time. But we must realize that serving God isn't just about good works. It also involves sound doctrine and pure lives. He sees you. He knows you. He knows your heart. Today is no different. But can I share this with you? As he did at the church at Thyatira, he's encouraging you. He's encouraging you today to come and to bow down at an altar and find the, the grace or the forgiveness or, or the strength or the hope or the joy. Maybe you're here and you don't have a lot of joy in your life. He, he's, he's invited you. He's encouraging you to come. To stand on the things that you know. Stand on the word of God. Things of, the things that have been taught. The things that you have heard. The things that are true. That we can literally come to that. Hey, we may, want to, we, we may need to pray for someone else. There's power. There's power that we have, church. Uh, the, the power of restoration and, 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 listen, and, and resurrection that we have. Through Jesus Christ, that, that the, the glory of God that you and I can be a part of and share in. That we literally, listen, the Spirit has creeped our hearts today. Maybe, maybe I don't know, maybe it's, on the, maybe it's on the negative side that you've done something, said something, your life hadn't been complete, your life is not where it should be, and, and, and the Spirit has literally pricked your heart. And He says, I, I give to her the ability to repent, the time to come and, and to share. You, you have that today. Uh, but, but maybe it should be because you need that encouragement. And, and God, God is here to encourage us, to let us know in that power and the glory that he has. That he encourages us to come and to share in mercy and grace and hope and joy and, and love. And, and the privilege to be the church. That's why I tell you, it's not, I, I, not that I get up on Sunday and say, man, i got to go to church. I get up and say, man, I get to go to church because it's a privilege to be in the presence of God. And you and I, get, we, we literally got to come here today and, and to share in the privilege of God and the, and, and the presence of God. And so what are we going to do about that? How, how is that going to work in our life? What are we going to allow the Spirit to do in our life as, as Christ encourages us to live our life, to do life? To face the next morning that he gives us. In the morning when the sun comes up. If he so tarries. The sun comes up. It will be another day of power and glory. That he's given you and I. What are we going to do with it? How are we going to live our life? Church what do we look like? When Jesus looks at us and says. I see you Larry Town Baptist Church. I see and here's your. Here's your commendation. What about condemnation? You and I. Hold the key. Would you come today? Would you follow the leading of the Spirit? Would you allow the Spirit to do the work in you that needs to be done in you so that we don't become a church like Tyra Tyra? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can come and that we can share. God, as we've come today, we've seen this church. I pray for those that are lost today that, dear Heavenly Father, they would come today. They would come seeking a Savior. They would come.